from Asian Korea in the 20th century. Just looking at Hmong history, in fact, will help us to really understand world history during the 20th century. And I will talk a little bit more about why. So as a scholar, um, I, I love to learn. I already mentioned that. But as I learned, as I grew up, as I researched, as I traveled around the globe, I often find it very troubling that I love history. I'm sitting in archives all over the world, trying to study about all kinds of people's experiences. But the people that I'm studying, the voices of Hmong people that I'm studying, they, they're not usually at the archives. The archives do such a great job, right? Of archiving memory, archiving experiences, the leaders, the very important people, their stories are at the archives. But the people who I'm trying to understand about their lived experiences are not at the archives. So that's my motivation for doing the kinds of work that I've been doing for the last 15 years or so. It's probably longer than that, um, but I've been researching across the globe about Hmong experiences. In particular, the United States, but I'm also working on a project of Hmong refugees in the global south, meaning Argentina and French Guiana. And they're such small populations, so we forget about them. We forget about them, but they exist. And so I'm working on a book project about the ways in which they have built community in very, very different societies. We know a lot about refugee resettlement in the global north especially the United States, because we're here in large numbers. But we know almost nothing about these smaller populations. So um, probably another year or two, then I'll have that, that book out. But I'm so pleased to be here to share with you. This book project is, um, it came about not because I am so smart and I had this great idea to write this book. It came about because of the people themselves, the veterans themselves. Uh, many of you may have heard of um, Hmong Thailand. But most people have not, right? Most people may have heard of a little bit, you know, a lot about the South Vietnamese, you know, army during the war, because Americans were very much overtly involved in Vietnam. But most people don't have any idea, right? Even Hmong people ourselves, the elders who lived in Laos, in Long Cheng, the name of your market here, it is that secret air base that the U.S. operated from. So people may know a little bit the elders who lived through the war, they see the pilots, they knew them. Family members saw how important of a role that the pilots played. They make or break the day. When the war was so intense, the pilots were the ones that gave hope to the ground troops. So the elder family members know about it, but very few people know about their experiences. How do you take Hmong individuals who grew up in the mountains of Laos, and then you take them, you pluck them into these training in modern technology, and before you know it, you become fighter pilots. And before I go forward, I, I just want to honor, um, he will be one of our panelists, but I want to honor Mr. Chu Tao, who's a resident. Mr. Tao, can you stand up? He, <laughs> he was not a veteran, uh, he was not a pilot, but I want to honor him because his two older brothers were two of the Hmong T-28 pilots who were killed in action. So I met him through other people while I was working on this oral history project, and I, I talked to him about his uh, experiences, remembering his brothers who were both killed, uh, twin brothers who were both killed. They both wanted to be T-28 pilots. They both wanted to contribute to the war effort and to support their families, and they were both killed. So. Uh, I thank him and others like him who have supported me for six years uh, before this book came to be. So for those of you who um, have seen the title, the title is called Fly Until You Die, an oral history of Hmong pilots during the Vietnam War. And I say that largely because some people say, well, Hmong people did not fight in the Vietnam War. Well, if you really know the true history of the larger war, it was all of Southeast Asia in so many ways. It's called Vietnam War by many Americans, but people in Asia, as some of you already know, call it the American War, right? Or the Indochina War. So however you want to call it, it was not just within the borders of Vietnam. The whole region became entangled. And in particular, Laos and Cambodia became intimately involved, whether they wanted to or not, right? 
right? It's like going from um, Wisconsin to Minnesota and Iowa. That's how the geography looks like. And so people became impacted whether they wanted to or not. And so uh, what I want to share is that uh, in 2012, uh, the Hmong pilots had a small reunion. And many of them came to this country, and they lived all over the country. They just wanted to rebuild their lives. They had this really important moment in their life as young men, 18 to 25 years old, excited about contributing to the war, excited about flying these aircraft that people have no idea about you know, the technology. How could something so heavy fly into the air, right? <clears throat> that fascination that drove them to also decide to participate in aviation training. But they came to the US after the war, and many, again, just continue on with their lives. Many didn't want to think about it anymore. Many wanted to forget, because the lives in which they were living in the United States was very different from what they came from. And so they didn't want to hold on to all of that difficulty. So many actually tried to forget. But in 2012, a small group wanted to have a reunion. So very long story short, they had a reunion. It took place in Minnesota. I wasn't even there. So I, I only tell the truth, okay? I wasn't even there, it's not my idea. They had a reunion, and what inspired them to do this is that they saw some of their friends who had strokes. They were in wheelchairs. They were coming to talk about this wonderful contribution that the Hmong people made during the Vietnam War as pilots from Laos during the secret war in Laos. We call it secret, secret only because the American public wasn't debating about it every day but the American government was allocating funding every year to support the humanitarian and, and military efforts in Laos. So for many of you, you know the story very well. I don't have to tell you, you know the story already. But for many others, maybe it might be the first time you're hearing that you know, Laos was so intimately uh, involved. And the US did not send soldiers, foot soldiers into Laos. We had over 2.7 million Americans served in Vietnam, but there were no foot soldiers sent to Laos. So the Hmong soldiers who were recruited by the United States became America's foot soldiers. Uh, not just Hmong, there were other people as well, but they became America's foot soldiers in Laos. And that's why every day now, we continue to think about Hmong contribution as really a part of the larger American military efforts. So back to the story, they had a reunion, they saw their friends, and a number of them said, wow, you know, those who were killed in action, they are gone. And those of us who are here, some can't even speak because they're sick. We're all going to die. This is them telling me the story. We're all going to die, and nobody's going to know what we did. That it's just going to die with us. So to make that really long story short, um, one of the wives of um, one of the pilots, he, she knew me when I was an undergraduate student. I grew up in Minnesota. So she knew me. She knew I had become a history professor. So when the small group of former pilots uh, were talking with each other, they didn't know what to do. They said, we need to do something, but that something they did not know. So Gao Li Yang is her name, and what she did was she told them, well, I know the person who can help you with this. So when she contacted me, it was actually to ask me if I had a student who could help these gentlemen. And so I talk about this a little bit, the process in the book, but um, when I asked her, well, I, I knew the stories. I'm a, I teach the Vietnam War. I feel like I'm, I have more expertise than maybe most you know, people do. But because there was so little written about these experiences, we don't get to learn about this in school. We don't even get to learn this in, in college. Vietnam War classes taught by other you know, scholars often don't even mention you know, Hmong experiences in Laos. So we don't get to learn about so I knew that there were a number of Hmong pilots, but I did not know exactly the nature of it either. Again, because they didn't exist. I knew of uh, one of the pilots who was killed in action. He was, after he died, his widow uh, and her four children, uh, she remarried, and she married my uncle, my father's youngest brother. So I knew a little bit bits and pieces and for Hmong people, uh, one of the pilots, his name is Leader. He's the, an American just flew with him. He becomes that, um, that symbol of the ultimate sacrifice that two more people make in war. So Leader was just a phenomenal pilot. He flew about 5,000 missions until he was you know, shot down. So 
bits and pieces I knew. But when they asked me if I had a student, I said, well, how many are left? Where do they live? Do you have money to pay for someone to do this work? Will the interviews or the research be done in Hmong or in English? So their responses were, we don't have any money. These are all retired guys. They don't have any money. Of course, the interviews or whatever needs to be done in Hmong, they all speak some English. But for them to really articulate their thoughts and feelings, they have to do it in their mother tongue. And so, and they're all over the country. So I told them that, you know, I have a lot of really good students. But many of them, if they don't know much about this history, they don't even know where to begin to ask the question. And then also, we have many good Hmong American students, but they may not be fluent enough in Hmong to actually engage in these deep you know, conversations with the elders. So I decided that um, because the elders have helped me in so many ways, and their sacrifices have enabled me to have this education that I have, and all the privileges that come with being able to go to school in this country and to be able to travel the world and just continue to learn and share what I learned. That's the best job ever, is to do what I love and to, to share with others. So because I feel so honored to, to know them, I decided I would volunteer to help them. So I spent my own personal research money for from 2013 to 2015, traveling all over the country, interviewing them, interviewing you know the CIA operatives who worked with them, the American pilots who trained them during the, the war, and then interviewing some of the widows and brothers by Mr. Tao, um, family members, uncles, and adults who knew these pilots when they were alive. And so that's what I did, travel all over the country. So the rest of my presentation will just tell you a little bit about what this book is about. It is a collective process for a group of people who often don't have voice to remember. And as I mentioned, many have tried not to remember these horrific events that they experienced. And here I was, 45, 50 years later, asking them to remember. So you can imagine all the conversations that I have with them in their homes, all over the country. You can imagine how heart-wrenching some of these conversations are. Um, and I'll share a little bit more. But at the end of my presentation, then I have a short eight-minute video that I want to have you, you know, watch because it's not all of the people I interview, but it's a sample of the Hmong veterans that I interview so that you can hear their voices. Um, I don't get to tell their stories all by myself. And I am not a filmmaker. Um, I am a storyteller, a historian, but as I interview people all over the country, I got to this point where I, I always videotape my interviews because it's part of what I want to do to contribute to the archives so that 50 years, 60 years, 100 years when I'm not here and many of us are not here anymore, that people who are interested in learning about our experiences, may they go to the archives, these documents, the films that I have created will be available to them. So part of my research is not just to understand them, but it's also archiving memory, archiving experiences, not just for myself and, and to write more books so that I can get tenure and promotion. That's all really important too. But I'm also contributing a service to the community and I think to, to, to the public in general to not forget some of these very important things that often do not make it to the history books. So the book, that's what the book is about. And um, again, it's a, almost a six year project. And I invested a lot of time and energy. And I mentioned to you that this is my fourth book, but um, I, I feel like this is my proudest book. And as a scholar, um, if you're familiar with the academic process, you know that two, three years, four, five years is actually pretty typical for academic writing. But when you're not familiar with it, you say, well, you must not be a very good researcher. <laughs> it took you a long time. But actually, I had to continuously educate the, the people that I interviewed that, oh, yes, it's, I'm still working on it. Yes, it's still coming. And when, it was very important to me that it didn't become just you know, a self-published you know, book and nobody will pay attention to it. It was very important to me that it had to be published as a scholar by a reputable press that will make our book an important part of you know global history in a, in a way. So when I finished the um, when I finished the 
manuscripts, I decided that I needed to get the best publishers that I could find. So I was able to get a contract with Oxford University. They have a series, an oral history series. And it was just perfect because uh, Todd Moy, who is the author of the Tuskegee Airmen, that book is also published in the series. So just so you know, as a you know former refugee child coming here, not speaking any English, and then learning my ABCs, and then um, getting a PhD from a major university, I'm still pinching myself that I actually have a book published by Oxford University Press. And that's the result of many kind people like you who have supported our community so that we can thrive in this, this country. So, so basically, um, again, it is really to give them voice. Uh, voices that are not here anymore, I can't do anything about it, but the voices that I was able to capture, um, they're, they're here, and I hope that they will be here for many more generations to come. So I just wanna say that I travel all over the country, I mean, not all over, but it is not every state, but two states that uh, the pilots um, lived in, I wanted to make sure that I interviewed some of the Americans to train them because it's not just, again, it is Hmong people's collective memory of the war experience and aviation training. But it's also very important to note that they didn't exist in isolation. Without the air commandos, without the hundreds and hundreds of Americans who went to Southeast Asia, without the US Air Force coming to train, it, it, they didn't, it wouldn't happen. So I wanted to make sure that I interviewed many of them so that they also contribute to making this, this very incomplete story a little bit more complete. It's not all. This is not the only truth. There are many truths. But I think that what I have done to include their voices, perspectives in larger American history, American immigration history, history of the war in Southeast Asia, that their perspectives, I think, help us to better understand this complex war that I think we continue to talk about every day. Whether we like it or not, Vietnam continues to be part of our lives every day. And every time we have, you know, um, some place around the world that we become involved in, everybody, policymakers, historians, everybody talks about, let's not have another Vietnam. So that continues to still play out every day in our lives, whether we like it or not. And so I, my goal is just to make this a little bit more complete by including these people's voices. So I went all over the country, um, mostly face-to-face -face interviews in their homes uh, with meals and many times uh, with tears and joy. And um, you know, some of them had such horrific experiences and in particular this one POW that um, I had to, you know, stop the interview because it was too emotional when he was describing uh, the prison camp. So we had to stop and continue the next day. So in my research, um, for many of you who do research, when you're interviewing you know, the, an alderman or you know, the mayor, you set up an interview, you go and ask your questions, and you get your answers. Well, the, my interviews, that's not how it works. In oral history, that's not how it works. You get there, I, I knew from my own previous research that it can't just be I get there, I ask my questions, and they're just gonna pour their hearts out to me. That's not how it works. So the interviews take days. And sometimes I plan you know, questions for a couple hours and it could be the whole evening. But when I get there, they often make a meal and I, they get to know me, they understand what I'm doing, and, and then they're willing to contribute their thoughts and feelings. And that trust is very important to be built before I ask them all these really hard questions. So anyways, um, this was able to take place largely because um, for, for many of you who are familiar with the war, we, again, you know a lot about what happened in Vietnam. But because Laos was a neutral country, uh, the US wasn't supposed to be there, and neither were the communist forces. But because it was a neutral country, it was next door to Vietnam, Everybody used Lao territory for their purpose. So um, at the time, we didn't acknowledge that we were there, but we know now that we were actually very actively involved, except that we didn't have troops on the ground, thousands and thousands of troops on the ground. But the reason why Hmong people were able to be trained as pilots is because, again, it wasn't just for Hmong, right? It was a secret operation called Waterfront. Again, American pilots, if they flew in Laos, and if they're shot down, then that's evidence that the US was in Laos. So what they did was that they trained 
local men, Lao and Lao and other minorities, to become pilots so that if they flew, you know, it would be seen as though they're, they're just from the local community. So this water pump was a, a secret operation um, to China, uh, but literally bringing these men from Laos over to Thailand where many of the American installations took place, right? So they came to Thailand, they trained under the secret operation. Um, very interestingly, uh, the experience of most people in Laos has been that as an ethnic minority, they sort of lived in the margins of society, but because of US involvement with Hmong people during the war and with General Bang Pao, whether you like him or not, regardless of your politics, you know, he was, you know, the Hmong general who worked very closely with the Americans, the CIA in particular, and really built that secret army. And so again, what regardless of your politics or mine, um, it was a transformation transformative you know, time in Hmong history. So it's not a huge group, right? But when you think about Hmong experiences, it's really significant. So many, many more people wanted to become pilots. So overall, we have about um, 50 Hmong men who participated in aviation training. Uh, 32 Hmong and one Kamu, another ethnic minority group in Laos, finished T-28 training. T-28 training, for those of you who uh, probably know a lot more about military aviation history than I do, but I learned a lot more than I uh, thought I would ever know about aviation history. And so, um, you know, the T-28s are these, you know, training aircraft, right? But during this war, they modified it into a bomber. And by doing so, um, the capacity was very different, but it was very accurate because they flew very close to the ground troops. The B-52s and F-4s drop bombs very high but they don't, they, they cause massive destruction, right? But they don't always hit the targets that we want them to hit. And so the T-28s were the ones that were right above the treetops and really supported the ground troops um, throughout the war. So those are the Hmong people who finished training, and so you only have about 32 uh, who, who did so. So it's not a huge group, but what they stood for was very important in Hmong history, and then also American war efforts during that time. Um, the saddest part is that the casualty rate was so high, right? Including, you know, Mr. Tao's two brothers. The fact that uh, Laos is, for those of you who've been to Southeast Asia, it's such a mountainous terrain, and the weather is very difficult, right? The topography, the weather can change from, you know, one side of the mountain and you get to the other side. So aircraft malfunction, crashing, enemy artillery, cost a very high number to be killed in action. So that's the saddest part. And at the beginning, you know, many people wanted to be pilots, but towards the end, it became something that people actually became fearful. So this is what the book is about. It gives you a history of uh, the origin of, you know, Hmong entanglement in the larger Vietnam War, and then uh, a very in-depth, intimate look at how people were selected to be trained, Again, even the pilots themselves, they knew about what they did. The family members heard about what their loved ones did, but very few actually know or can tell a larger comprehensive story about this operation. So that's what my book tries to do is to uh, clear that and to help people understand. So how they, they were selected to be trained, um, and just their experience flying in long tanks, a uh, very, very difficult airstrip for them to survive. And then I also included some of the widows who, again, war is, is difficult for all of us, right? When men go to war, I mean, now we have many women who go to war too, but at the time when men went to war, women didn't only do their work, they did their work and all of the men's work. And so it impacted them just tremendously. And when a pilot dies, you know, it, it completely shatters, not just this immediate family, but the whole community. So that's what the book is about, and then it ends with them, you know, starting over in this country and then kind of reassessing what the war meant. And I know in my heart that many of them will write this book. I've read many, many, you know, um, biographies and memoirs by American veterans, and I know that these Hmong pilots, they will write their own too if they could. But since they can't, I, they've given me the privilege to, to help tell their story. 
So again, I just have a very short video I want to show you. This is part of, oh. okay. So if that's not gonna work, then I will. <coughs> Yeah. 
ਵਾਲੇ ਤੇ ਆਪ ਤੇ ਪਾਪਾ ਦੇ ਚੱਲਾਂ ਨਾ ਜੇ ਵਾਜ ਉਹ ਕਰ ਗਾਣੇ ਲੱਗ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਤੀਨ ਵਟੇ ਤੋਂ ਚਾਰ ਆਪਣੇ ਨੂੰ ਜਦ ਵਾਜਾ ਆ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਤੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਤੋਂ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਕਹਾ ਰਹੇ ਨਾ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਉਪਾ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਤਾਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਤੇ ਚੱਲਾਂ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਕੁਝ ਵੀ ਆ ਜਾ ਤੇ ਚੱਲਾਂ ਦਾ ਉਹ ਤੇ ਜਨਾਬ ਸੇ ਦੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਚੱਲਾਂ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਕਰ ਗਾਣੇ ਲੱਗ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਅੱਛਾ ਆ ਰਹੇ ਆਪੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹ ਲਗਾ ਦੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਅੱਛਾ ਆ ਰਹੇ making a longer documentary um, because I think it's very important most elders will not be able to read this academic book I've written so I want to make sure that they have access to so the documentary will be I, I didn't think that you all knew how to speak Hmong already so I did include the subtitles but in the film I'll, I'll do the same because I think it's very important to hear them in their own voices but then for others to listen and I hope that you see towards the end when I ask them, um, was it worth it, right? It's, I, I personally think that they, you know, they quote their truth. And the great thing is that they don't all agree. And what one, how, you know, we may all be in the same place at the same time and something happens, but we each will interpret this according to who we are, how we see the world in our own personal lived experiences. So some of the pilots came to this country, they had really good sponsors who helped them, they thrived, they got a house right away, they had nice jobs, others really struggled. Even if they resettled in Hawaii, they moved to Illinois or Minnesota and Wisconsin to be near other Hmong people for support. So that's vastly what the book is about. But I want to um, just end my presentation with a a uh, quote that I want to share with you. When I was interviewing a pilot who was killed in action, uh, his brother, I was interviewing his brother in, um, I was interviewing his brother in Michigan, and when I finished interviewing his younger brother, who, who, who still speaks about the pain of the day that his brother died as though it just happened. So when I finished interviewing him, uh, he said, well, uh, do you want to interview my mother? I, I was like, I felt like I had struck gold. I did not know that his mother was still there and that he, she could speak. He went to pick her up. She comes, and I conducted the most heart-wrenching interview I've ever done with a mother talking about losing her son. And many of you may have similar experiences. But as a researcher, it's our responsibility, right, to take care of our interviewing, but it's also our responsibility to take care of ourselves. When I hear these stories, because they're not my personal story, but because I share their migration history, I share the struggles that they struggle in this country, it's very difficult to listen to their stories without just being in the moment with them. But I cannot pretend to understand her pain so this is Mi Yang, the mother of Pilot Du Chong Li. Um, I end the book giving her the final words. Um, and I just felt so honored to be able to do that. And she lived to see a copy of the book. So basically, um, you know, you can read this for yourself. But in case you're in the back, you can't read. I'll just say, this is what Mi Yang said. I mean, she said it beautifully in Hmong. But you know, I tried my best to turn it into English so they could understand. 
it's like I think it's true that we had leaders like General Lang Tao, but without the sacrifice of thousands like my son, it would have been never but possible. I'm so glad that you, Ming, is talking to me. You remember my son's sacrifice. As a mother, I will remember my son until I can no longer breathe. As long as I'm alive, I will miss him. So many things remind me of him, a photo of the old country, or the sound of the aircraft, bring back memories of him. Even though my son is gone, I'm glad that you still remember that I am his mother and that I'm still here. You give me hope. So uh, this project was just supposed to be a small OSP project, but I think it has turned to be something more than I ever in the condition, and it has given me hope too that more people will understand. And despite all of the evil things that we have going on in this country, I have hope that you know we we will continue to remember and acknowledge that you know everybody that contributes to making America the great country that it is um, are, are recognized for their sacrifices. So I'll end it, and um, I think. Thank you.
if you mess up a little bit, then you will just hit the building or the mountain. So a couple of pilots die that way. So not in the air, but that way. So those are the kinds of reasons why the casualty rate was so high. And I talk about the book that not all the pilots who were killed were killed in action, right? But because we were actually living in the war zone, even if they were transporting someone for a business purpose, for Bang Tao, if the plane crashed, I count that as still being, you know, killed in action because, you know, not by enemy fire, but because of, you know, a couple of, of them hit the mountain. Because the, the air is so, you know, the fog is so thick, and sometimes you might be flying, the weather changes, and before you know it, you know, the mountain is right there. So some, some of them were killed in that way. Any other questions? How are you finding your my documentary could still use more funding. <laughs> so if you know more funding, please feel, feel free to, to help me because here's what I did. When I began, I was using my handy cam, right? Videotaping, but then as I got smarter, I said, you know, I need to document this for other people um, too. Then I hired a student who was a film major, so she helped to videotape some of them. So I have, you know, as a faculty member, I have a small research fund, so I have been exhausting my personal <laughs> research fund over the years. And the pilots, they, they, they're really appreciative. They ask me, you know, you know, are you okay? I said, I'm okay. Um, but the university has been really good to me. But I actually am just doing the documentary mostly with my own small research fund. I haven't applied for any major funding, but I probably should. I will be sabbatical in the fall. So I think that between now and then, I mean, I've been working on it, and I have a couple of students helping me, because I really believe in empowering students too. When they're working on this documentary, they're actually learning. Uh, I think experiential learning is really important. So so I think I still need a little bit of help with, um, especially, I, I don't need any money for myself, but to pay students and other experts to, to help. And also, when I use footage, um, I have to pay for a copyright. Right? So those are some of the expenses that I did not anticipate, but I, I will incur. So do let me know if you have any suggestions. Always welcome. Are you aware of the uh, T-28 that's on display at the uh, Sheboygan Airport? Yes, I was there. I showed this video there. I made it specially for that event. Were you there as well? Yes. Okay. So I was there and I actually spoke for a little bit and then showed the video and then some of the pilots who came for the reunion, they, they were there. So I, know I worked with Don uh, Hemenek who was really instrumental in getting that ready. So were, were, you, were you involved in restoring that aircraft? Okay. But it is a site of, and again, people always ask me wherever I go, why did Hmong people choose to come to Wisconsin? Right? I mean, I don't know. I know that some of you who are Hmong here, you can ask that question too. And I'm sorry to tell you that Hmong people did not choose with us. Okay, if you didn't know that, know that now. We actually didn't know where Wisconsin. We did not choose Wisconsin. You can blame yourselves. You can blame the churches and the good hearts of the Wisconsinites who opened their homes and churches for us. So that's how we ended up here. So. That aircraft is a reflection of the commitment of the Wisconsin community uh, to recognize, to acknowledge Hmong contributions. And I'm happy to say that I call Wisconsin home now, even though when people say, where are you from, it's in Minnesota. But I'm happy to say how, how wonderful Wisconsin is. And I'm not just saying this because you're all here and I'm here, but I think because you know, you look at Sheboygan in that nice memorial, right? That was in 2005. 2016 was when Minnesota, the highest concentration of Hmong people, had a memorial dedicated to Hmong. So Wisconsin is a little bit ahead. And then, you know, the T28, I mean, the men and women who worked really hard restoring that, I think it says a lot about Wisconsin. In, in my opinion. But that's a great exhibit. If you, if you haven't seen it, please go see it. Yes, Joel. Yes, Joel.
I studied political science when I was in college, mm -hmm. and I always wondered, do the public know why did they get T-28 rather than those advanced aircraft? Do they know why? Well, we, I mean, we know, we know why, right? I mean, they were first used in South Vietnam, but, you know, we gave South, the South Vietnamese Army nice F-4s and others, and so they were actually, I mean, you do tell me what you, you, you know too, but um, instead of discarding these aircraft that probably shouldn't have been used anymore, um, we weren't supposed to be involved, right? So then the aircraft, it was just easier to be used there. But if you have information, tell me what you think. I was always thinking those are left over World War II. They could not ship back to America. And this is a secret war, guess what? Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. That's how they won't get those left over. All the guns, and left over during World War II. Some they of get, them, yeah. Yeah, secret, yeah. yeah. But these aircraft were actually used in South Vietnam too. And many American pilots, the first people to fly the T-28s were actually not Hmong at all. They were actually American pilots who flew those missions until the local men could be trained. So it wasn't just to give the bad planes to the you know indigenous forces, but American pilots actually volunteered to fly these missions first. I think we're out of time for this session, right? Or maybe one last quick question? There's another question and comment. Oh. I, I had seen a documentary on four warrior controllers at one point. And the reason they they used the the training type aircraft is they were much slower and they were able to see in through the through the through the forest. If you're flying an F4, you're just you're you're past everything yeah. before before you can see it. And that was one of the reasons that that they used uh, a slower aircraft. Mm -hmm. It's a really good point. I mean, like I said earlier, that's where they're more accurate too, because they actually can see the ground forces. I think you have a oh, you're one of the panelists. Okay, I see that on your yeah. hand. Uh, it's uh, well, we're happy to be here. That's uh, we're the three uh, Vietnam veterans. But anyway. Not one of us knew anything about Hmong pilots. Not one of us knew anything about it. This is the first, first I've ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know not, absolutely nothing about it. And that's very common because it wasn't supposed to be known, right? It was supposed to be a secret operation. So unless even American pilots, I mean, the many that I interviewed, right, they didn't know either. They flew in South Vietnam and then they volunteered for this program mm -hmm. in the other theater. And then when they get there, then that's when they find out about the Hmong and the Lao and other pilots who were being trained to fly. So, so what your, your experience is pretty common, that it wasn't something that was publicized during the war. And even years after the war, right? Even now, I mean, without a project like this, it, we, we, wouldn't, we would continue to not know. So this project, I recently, this is really interesting, and then we'll move on to the next panel, but, um, I was recently invited to give a talk at the U.S. Air Force Academy at Gerber Field, where the decision to train Hmong and Lao and other indigenous forces in water pumps, it was made there. And here I was, years later, being invited to give a talk about this project to over 150 current special ops young men and women training forces around the country. And they've never heard of this. Well, these, these pilots were, did, uh, well, you know, like the American people, you know, you got the draft and all that, and, uh, uh, but the, these Hmong people, did they, um, obviously, I'm, were they American citizens where they had to go for their country, or was it, or they just volunteered? Well, it's a really complex story, right? Like I tell in the book, <laughs> um, some people really wanted to, because they're, you know, you were being paid by, the CIA, right? And also the Lao Army, when you're a, a pilot. So some volunteered, some really wanted to go, and others went, as one of the men said, you know, they didn't have anybody volunteering anymore. So they needed, so gentlemen public said, you go. So it's not all the same. And even the monk soldiers on the field, 
if there wasn't the kind of glass as we know, the glass that took place here in the United States. But again, uh, many, you can say volunteer, but many others didn't have a choice. Like Hua Xiong said, whether you want to go fly or not, you didn't have a choice. Either you do that or you become a foot soldier. And some of the gentlemen here today will tell you more about their different roles that they play. Um, being a grunt was worse. A lot of the pilots talk about, well, if I if I'm killed, then it's you know they kill me and I'm up in the air. And so, but I don't have to check through the jungle carrying guns for months. So you didn't have a choice. You 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 have to do something. So some for some of the pilots that was a better route than to be on the ground. So I'll turn it over to. You're in charge. I'm going to turn it over to you. And then I think we have one more question. One question. You were talking about the aircraft flying slow that they could see more than that at four could see. I was talking to uh, Vietnam and I was talking to L-19 pilots. Uh, that was a U.S. version Cessna aircraft. And what they would say, it would fly real low and, and they'd be a calm and everybody else, they would kind of hide their height, duck down, but they could not. They always wanted to see after the airplane went past them, they would turn their faces and look at the airplane departing. And a lot of the pilots would look backwards and could see the Vietnamese faces like that. And they just stuck out just like that. So by flying slow, they spotted them just because they had a tendency to look, look at the aircraft as it passed them. Yeah, absolutely. But thank you for your questions. And we'll continue the conversation. So should we just invite the panelists up? Yu Li, Yu Yi, Bang's bios, and then um, after that, then she can start. Uh, Dr. Chia Yu Yi Bang is professor of history and associate vice chancellor of global inclusion and engagement at the University of Wisconsin uh, Milwaukee. She is also founder and director of Hmong Diaspora Study Program and is the author of three books of which Fry Until You Die, an oral history of Hmong pirates in the Vietnam War, is what we talk about here today. She received her PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota in 2006. She also holds an MA degree in Public Policy from the Hanfrey Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota and a BA in political science with an emphasis on international relations and French from Gustavo Adolfo's college. Uh, Gustavus Adolfus. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. She has received recognitions for her commitment to diversity and excellence in higher education through the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents Diversity Award. Wisconsin Women Making History, UW System Outstanding Women of Color in Education Award, and Hmong Women of the Year by the Hmong Consortium. Please join me to welcome Dr. Yu Yi Bang, who will be moderating today's discussion, Soldiers' Perspective on the Vietnam War. say that um, thank you for being here. Um, I've talked a lot, but to me it's really important to hear from the, the veterans themselves. Um, no one can tell our own stories better than we do ourselves. So the kind of work I do is just that you know many people can't you know actually tell their own stories. And I know that we have um, five veterans with very different experiences, um, some more similar than others. And I think that um, we're going to learn a lot. And I, I love this opportunity. Too often, we will have a panel with just Hmong veterans or American veterans, and they're all Hmong Americans now too, so veterans. But we don't have a lot of opportunities to come and sit down together like this. So I think you all did a really great job to make sure that we have representation. So again, I will try to not talk as much, because if you let me, I will talk all night. So whenever I tell my students, I used to be really shy, no one, no one believes me. But it's the truth. So um, I just want to introduce the panelists, um, Mr. Yo Tao, uh, no, Yo Muan, Yo Muan. I'm just meeting him for the first time. So Song Jang Muan is his name. 
and she's a veteran. We'll learn more about his personal experience by Mr. Chu Tao, who I already introduced a little bit to those of you. He's also a veteran, but um, who was a radio operator. Again, we'll learn more about his, his experience. And then we have um, Tom, yeah, Tom Man Manon, okay, and then Dale Van Manon, and then Glenn Zimmerman. So five individuals who lived through an era separately, but in some way together. At the same kind of period, you were there, but very different experiences. So I thought um, the, the planning committee um, came up with a few questions that we would like you to help us understand about your experiences so that you can help us to understand, even better understand, the larger experiences. So the first question is um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I know there's five of you and we don't have a lot of time, so maybe you can give us some brief you know, responses. Tell us a little bit about your experience leading to the war. What were you doing before you were involved directly in the war? So I know Mr. Tao and Mr. Moa said that they will speak some English, but they will speak Hmong. And my job, they are testing me to see how good my Hmong is to translate. So I will do my best. Um, but anyway, so um, yeah. So who would like to go first? OK. So Mr. Moore will go first. Okay. Okay. We we just want you to listen to him speak more clearly. <laughs> Okay, my name is uh, Yu Moa. I came to this country 1976 on Dubai. So 43 years and seven months already. <laughs> yes, very long. My English is not quite clear. I want you to translate for me, okay? So I will talk my native language, Hmong language, so she can translate to you. You probably understand better. They understand you. He was part of the first cohort to go train in Thailand. Mm -hmm. He was part of the first cohort to go train in Thailand. I want to speak more and let her translate. Oh, that's okay. I want to hear the German language. Oh, okay. 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 He was in training for just two months. Okay. 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 ก็เรียนเรียนการเข้าออกไปจนอ่าทัพปอดนี่เด้อาหารเด้อทัพปอดนี่เด้อืมเด้อปอดปอดโจโจอืมเอ็นซิกิวอืมโมเดอร์อ
and then they just you know uh, walked around all day. They come back day on day some more time. They come up in on some day time until they took the bus. Okay, get me get a bear, they get them a lot of Yeah, so he was a student before he joined the military. So we'll continue on another line. So maybe can you name on day one more time? Okay, excuse me. Uh, soldier is a life strong for life. So excuse me, I like to stand to uh, speak. It's better because uh, soldier life is, should be strong for life. So, okay, uh, I speak uh, English a little bit, introduce myself. Then uh, after I describe, the uh, duty what I did, then uh, maybe I speak more. And uh, uh, Dr. Chia, uh, I like she to translate to English so everybody uh, uh, can understand. Because when I came here, this country, uh, just find something for me. So I don't have time to go to school. Then uh, very hard for me to uh, start uh, uh, to go through to uh, study English. So my name is Joa Zhu Tong. Joa in Green. So everybody like to call me Mister Green or <laughs> Uncle Green, like an Uncle uh, Uncle Sam, some song like that. <laughs> so they like to call easier Mister Green. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> My name is George Chu. I am the uh, uh, chief of the uh, chapter 26, uh, with Lao Hong Disconcerned Veteran. So, uh, <clears throat> my rank is uh, first lieutenant. And um, I start uh, to uh, be a service. Uh, about my age, uh, 14, 15. I go to school, part of the school, and after school, I back home to hold a gun to protect the valley at home with my, uh, my brother. Uh, so, uh, from uh, 1963 until 1964, then I go to, uh, uh, I start to go to school. After that, then I go to uh, the capital of the uh, uh, CIA in Longchamp to go to uh, radi Radio uh, Como uh, in Longchamp. And then from 1965 uh, until 66, then I get to a from the title of uh, um, radio operator. And I, uh, uh, the uh, uh, parachute jumper uh, troop. So after I done, uh, uh, I graduate, then I start to uh, 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 fight. And now I start uh, to English right now, and I describe uh, in Hmong. And uh, uh, Dr. Chia uh, translate to uh, English. So. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And uh, maybe I just talk a little uh, more about what you, you heard before, or what you hear from now. I don't know either when I, uh, I work over there, but uh, uh, after everything's over, we came to the United States. Then, General Rang Bao will tell us what job, what we did, and we received from American President and CIA. The duty, what we have to do, what it is. So, 
Mi dong no, mi jack fight but after he came to your destiny, then he uh, uh, he tell us exactly. So uh, maybe some of you didn't know it. Ah, xiong yi xie jiu bo zuo jiu bei, zuo 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 jiu bao de jie wu mu jie. So basically, um, kind of what he mentioned earlier, but from 63 to 64, it's pretty typical for a lot of uh, young men at the time. During the day, he would attend school, but then at night, he would participate in guarding the village, so you know, serving in, in a soldier uh, role at that time. So, the so I realized how difficult it was to be a soldier in the village, uh, so much killing and shooting, and I decided then that I wanted to learn how to be a radio officer. So being a radio operator is not, you know, it's, it's equally frightening. But the, the best part is that you're actually in the back and you're not in the front line. So it's a little bit safer. Yeah. Now, <laughs> อ่าเจ้าลุรีกูมุตัวจ้าเจ้าลุรีเนอะอ่าจ้าเจ้าอันเนี่ยเราก็พันทหารล่อมุตัวจ้าเจ้าลุรีเจ๋งเนี่ย
uh, I don't think I ever read the fun section of the paper. I went right to the sports section. And at that time it was Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers and the Milwaukee baseball team. So uh, I didn't know anything about Vietnam, what was going on. And after, uh, after I graduated, I had a job for a short time. And then at that time, uh, they had a special deal, deal in the Marines. Uh, you could go in for two years active and four years inactive. So I went down and I joined the Marines uh, and uh, I flew down to San Diego, California. That's where I went to boot camp. And even in boot camp, they didn't, they didn't tell us much about Vietnam, uh, a little bit. So after boot camp, went a few miles away to Camp Pendleton to do some training. Uh, <clears throat> And they gave me a little bit of training uh, to become a radio operator. And so I was classified as a radio operator uh, infantry. And uh, during that training, they, they told us about Vietnam, not a whole lot, but they told us what was going on and how bad it was. But for me, it, it still didn't really sink in. I thought, well, you know, unless you're right there, you know, and uh, for me, uh, so I didn't think too much of it until I would get there. So that's what it was for me leading up to the war. Hi, uh, thanks for having us all here today. It's a, it's a real privilege to be with the Mounds. I mean, we have a lot of respect for you. So I appreciate you being here with us all together. Uh, like Tom said, I'm, uh, we're brothers. Uh, we grew up in Westy Pier. That's kind of like a suburb of Green Bay. And uh, we come from a family of 17. Ten boys and five girls. Mom and dad was 17. Uh, anyway, we, uh, I think most of us actually went to a Catholic grade school and high school. And uh, I know me, I wasn't a school person. I would, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, when I went to school, I would just barely pass. And I couldn't wait to get outside and play. My best subject was phi ed, where I could go out and run around outside. But anyway, uh, growing up in a big family, had a, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of fun, always something to do. But um, when I, before I went into service, I, well, I graduated and from high school and uh, I didn't have no experience or no traits. I, I was kind of like, I consider myself a dummy, more or less. Uh, so my dad went to, uh, well, he worked at Fort Howard Paper Company. Now I think it's George Pacific in Green Bay. And at the time, I didn't really, I didn't want to go, go on with my education. So uh, I thought, well, I'm gonna go in my dad's footsteps, you know? And I, so I figured, I, so I went to uh, Fort Howard to get a job. No go. Went to Charmin, now I think it's Procter Gamble. Uh, no go. I went to, um, uh, in Deep Pier, um, Nicolet. Nicolet Paper, went there. And at the time with the war, nobody was hiring. So I thought, well, you know, and I was clueless, like Tom said, I was clueless about the war. I didn't know nothing about it. I just, you know. So I thought, well, nobody's hiring, so I'm just gonna go in get my time uh, over with and get, come out and get a job. But um, I had no clue what I was in for. Um, it just, <laughs> yeah, it was, Tom was in and uh, um, when he come home and leave, uh, I signed up to go in because I, I'm, positive, I'm pretty sure he was able to stay home about five extra days because I signed up just for the fact that I wanted to get over with, I wanted to get a job and start making money. And, uh, so when I went in, uh, same thing, we went down to <clears throat> San Diego, but I was uh, strictly infantry. Did a lot of walking, a lot of walking. And, and uh, when you're over there, <laughs> you don't walk straight up. You're, you're kind of hunched over all the time. You're carrying a lot of ammunition, food, and whatever, you know, whatever you need when you're out. Anyway, that was kind of my leading up to the war. Uh, it was. Yeah, I was I wasn't not prepared for what I was gonna uh, 
was going to happen. It just, I wasn't prepared for that at all. Thank you. Glenn? Hi, my name is Glenn Zorman. Uh, pretty much like what these guys said, we were 19 year old kids and we didn't know what was going on with the war and didn't really care. It was, it was in the background. Uh, much like right now, the flooding going down, going on down in Mississippi and that, it's not affecting us, so we don't really care about it. We see it on the news, but mm -hmm. so what? That's the way Vietnam was at 19 for me. Um, I was into fixing cars and chasing girls and going out drinking at night with my buddies, and the war just, it was nothing that was gonna affect me. I had a good job. I worked at the post office in Appleton all through high school, and when I got out of high school in 1967, they hired me full time. Uh, so I was making good money working for the government at the post office. I figured I'll do this for 20 years and retire and I'll, I'll be doing good. And then in January 1969, I got a draft notice. Uncle Sam said, you need to come and see us. By July of 69, I was in Vietnam. And I was with the 199th Light Infantry Brigade uh, I was a machine gunner's assistant, carrying a rifle, going through the jungle every day. It was a lot of fun. Uh, then I knew what the war was all about. I saw guys getting wounded and killed and, and going home in body bags, and uh, it wasn't a joke anymore. So. So maybe, Glenn, the next question is really, you know, expanding what you just began. So you tell us a little bit about your experience during the war. So you began already, you saw, you know, friends being killed, body bags, you know, any other experience during the war you'd like to share with us? Uh, I did 15 months over there in Vietnam. The war is, the war is hell. I mean, war is war. And, uh, like Dale said, you do a lot of walking through the jungle and you get sent on missions. A lot of my time was spent in, in Cambodia. Now, we weren't supposed to be there. We didn't have permission to be in Cambodia, but our unit was assigned uh, to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, <clears throat> where it made a left-hand turn and came uh, due east toward Saigon. And uh, so we'd get in the helicopters in the mornings and they'd take us over the border into Cambodia, and, and that's where we were for a week or two weeks or three weeks at a time, whenever our mission was. Uh, we'd stay in the jungle until our mission was over, and then they'd bring us back. But, we were in Cambodia most of the time, uh, at least for the first 10 months I was over there. We were, we were in Cambodia illegally. And then in May of uh, 1970, Nixon signed a treaty with Cambodia to allow us to go there legally. And uh, they picked up our whole base camp and moved our whole base camp across the border into Cambodia so we wouldn't have to get in helicopters and fly over it. But yeah, that, um, that was an infantryman's job was just to go out and shoot people. You, you were hired to kill, that was it. And that's what we did, so. Uh, an interesting perspective on, on Vietnam that, that I've had. Um, before I went over, I remember President Johnson telling everyone that we had to be there, we had to draw a line in the sand, we had to stop the North Vietnamese from progressing any further. If they went any further, if they could take over South Vietnam, they would take over Thailand, they would take over Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia, they wouldn't stop. The communists would keep moving. So I didn't have any qualms when I was drafted about going and fighting for my country. Um, I agreed that we had to stop them someplace and we were gonna stop them in South Vietnam. Um, but when I was in the war in South Vietnam, when we got in the jungles, there were, the cities were for a lot of people with a lot of smaller houses and stuff, and they were the ones that we were fighting the war for, basically. But in the jungles, we'd run into these small villages of, of huts that people made out of uh, branches covered with banana leaves and palm trees and whatever that they lived in. I mean, they had nothing, virtually nothing to live on. They had dirt floors. They slept on banana leaves on the floor. Uh, they dug grubs up in the morning 
in the Domo, big fat Domo, yeah. big as my thumb, yeah. right? That was their protein for the day. They would save that and eat that for their meal. Uh, other big insects they could find. Once in a while they'd be able to catch a monkey or something, or a rat that they could eat. But that's the only meat they had. They grew gardens next to their huts with some vegetables in. And a couple times a year, the men would go down to the Mekong Delta and bring back bags of rice that they would live on. We didn't have five kinds of cereal in the cupboard like we had. They didn't have cupboards. They didn't have beds. They didn't have microbes. They had nothing. That's how they lived. And as we met those people and, and set up our own little villages and stuff, those people didn't care if they were capitalists or communists. It didn't matter. So you start to wonder why are, why are we here fighting this war for these people that are living just fine? They were happy the way they were. They had nothing, but they were happy. They had families. They had enough to live on from day to day. They still married. They still had kids. They didn't need us to be there. The only ones that needed us there were the ones in the big cities. They were the ones who were trying to fight to keep the communists away from us. So I, you get. Two different perspectives. So, so your view, your views really change when you're actually over there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I still felt like I was doing something good. Sure. I still felt like we needed to be there to stop communism, but I could see that we didn't need to be there for the people in the jungle and the villages and whatever. So, just a different perspective on it. Yeah. So maybe they'll share a little bit about your your experience. I guess when I was over there, I was clueless. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, you're, you got your different, you're, you got your training, you know, but you just, uh, you don't really expect uh, what's going on. It's, uh, first, I uh, flew into Da Nang, and then we come out of there, and then we uh, flew over to, to uh, Anwa, and the first, first day we had there, uh, we had like a makeshift, classroom out of ammo box and we had mortar rounds coming in and it's like you're wondering what the heck is going on it's just it's you're just it's 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 something you know when you're over there I mean you know it's you know I hate to say it but at the time I hated the people I hated everything about it I hated the people I hated the weather I hated everything I wanted to come home it was the only time I was away from home when I went into service and I hated everything about it, you know, and that haunted me for years and years and years, and and um, but you know, it's it's uh, yeah, we did a lot of walking. I was in infantry, and we did a lot of walking, and and uh, you know, and you uh, come across dead bodies, and you know, it's sad. It's uh, you know, people don't realize how good they got it back here. It's just <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean. We were like, uh, it was like heaven for us when we were set up along this road and, and we had like a, a big water hole, it's just a mud hole, and you had these big leeches in there. We'd take grenades and we'd go down there and we were going to take a bath, and that was like a luxury. We'd pop a grenade, throw them in there, and kill some of the leeches, because then whenever you come out, you still had a few on you. But it was just, that was like living in heaven for us at that oh. But I mean, it's it's an experience, you know, you got to sit in your foxholes at night and you hear these stories about uh, about the enemy sneaking up on you slitting your throat and that and you just it's it's not fun it's not fun you know it's it's sad i mean it just it's uh at the time you know you you you, you don't uh with your all your emotions you they come back now you know but Back then, it's like you didn't have time, you know. You were watching out for yourself and your buddies and that. And, I mean, uh, you're talking about being scared when you got to sit in those foxholes at night. It's scared. You're scared. Uh, I went, one night, one night, I went out in a, a night ambush. <laughs> you talk about being scared. That's you go out with about four or five guys all by yourself, and you you they send you to an area. You set up all your booby traps, your claymore mines, and you have no idea what you're going to run into. We didn't run into nothing, but we set all the stuff up, and you're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. Something would have come in, whether it would have been a little mouse or, or a rabbit or whatever. 
everything would have been dead from, from the Claymore mine, especially. But it was just, it was an experience, you know, and we never ran into anything. And thank God, you know, then we, you, it, early morning, you, you come back and you sit out there all night. You talk about being scared. And you're it's scared. I mean, it's, it's an experience, you know, and, uh, you know, and it's, yeah, it's sad. It's sad. It's just uh, what goes on. And people sit behind down in Washington behind these desks, and they have no clue what's going on. And they said, oh, you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do that. I tell you, I saw enough stuff over there that it would, you'd shake your head. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when I saw the first guy get, get killed, it's, it's, you know, at the time, you know, you just, I hate to say it, but, you're, you know, I mean, you're sitting there watching. And you're actually cheering, and and it, it just you know, and then later on as you you come back to the real world, and you know it's like you know you, you know even now it's like you know how could I, how can you be like that you know it's just it's sad you know it's just it's part of the war you know that's the way it is you're a different person you are you know when I came back I was somebody else you know than what I am now but back then you're trained how to to fight how to survive. Like I said, you know, it's it's no fun going out on a night ambush or sitting in your foxhole and you don't know what to expect and and you get incoming rounds and you, you there's times where uh, I was where you could you could hear the bullets whizzing by your head. They're that close. Oh yeah. So there's <laughs> there's times I I I should have never come back to like talk about three of here or like these gentlemen or whatever, but it's a it's tough. It's it's sad, you know, and you, there's uh, many nights you have bad dreams, nightmares, and just they just don't go away. And then what but, you're what you're saying is, you know, I talked to enough Vietnam veterans where, depending on what your role is, right? So some people never saw, you know, war. They were yeah. in office, and then they come back with a different experience, and then those of you who are the grunts, right? You. It's a very, very different experience when you come back and it impacts you in, in such a dramatic, different way. Yeah, uh, we'll come back on okay. it. Okay. Right, we'll and then we'll come back down the line. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> after I got my training at Camp Pendleton after boot camp, uh, they trained me as a radio operator for a short time. Then we flew over to Hawaii. We refueled in Hawaii. And then from there, we flew over to Vietnam. We landed in Da Nang, uh, which was the main airport for guys coming in and guys going out. And when I got off the plane, wow, the heat. <laughs> it was almost like being in a constant sauna. And that's why you, a lot of the pictures that you see about Vietnam, a lot of guys have their shirts off. So anyway, uh, it took me about a week to get to my unit. Uh, my unit was about 40 to 50 miles south of Da Nang. It was at the base camp called Anwa. When I got there, uh, this guy showed me around the base camp and showed me everything what they had. And uh, then a couple days later, we're, uh, we're packing up, we're gonna go on an operation. And I thought I was gonna carry a radio. And, uh, the sergeant who was in charge of the radio operators, he comes walk, walking over to me, and, uh, and I'm the fresh new guy. And the fresh new guy always gets the worst bottom job. So the sergeant, he comes up to me and he says, uh, I want to, well, he introduced me, I mean, he introduced himself to me. And he says, uh, he points to his backpack, he says, I, I want you to carry that backpack. And I looked in that backpack and here's a, Big backpack, of, big backpack of pipes. And uh, they were about, I don't know, roughly 18 to 20 inches long. And uh, uh, they were about inch and a half in diameter. And uh, uh, one end was smaller than the other end so you could shove them together and you can make a big, tall metal pole. You could put an antenna up on top and run a cable down to your radio. And that was for uh, calling a longer distance if you needed air support or artillery, but that was uh, one of the biggest and heaviest backpacks they had. And on these operations, uh, we would all walk out from our base camp, or they'd fly us to another base camp miles away, and then walk out from there. 
or they would fly us out to uh, the lowlands, the rice paddies, uh, hills, mountains, or jungle growth, just drop us off there. And we'd be out there for roughly, I don't know, roughly three to six days. Then you come back into base camp and rest up for about a week and then go back out again. Uh, but we had our own, own special little group, uh, the communication group, uh, which consisted of about 10 guys. We had uh, uh, two officers, the sergeant who was in charge of the radio operators, and an extra three or four radio operators. And then I was carrying the backpack of pipes and it was a couple of other guys. So when we were out on these operations, uh, we had a couple platoons walk in front of us, and then we had our little group, and then a couple platoons behind us. And that's the way we traveled. And uh, whenever we came to a halt to sit down and eat some sea rations or for some other reason, uh, I would take that backpack off and I would always prop it up against any tree or a bush or a rock. And then when they said that they were gonna move on, start walking, well, now I would, I would sit on the ground and put my back against that backpack and get one strap out of my shoulder and then on the other side do the same thing. Then I would roll over onto my hands and my knees and then I would push up with my hands and my feet in order to get up and start walking. <coughs> so I carried that backpack for roughly eight months then I got to carry a radio for two months, and then the last couple months I got to stay in the base camp uh, and help out with supplies. But on, on those operations, uh, we walked miles and miles and miles, uh, slept on the ground many nights. Uh, I saw a lot of ugly things out there, uh, a lot of dead bodies of the enemy and some of our own. Uh, I had some really close calls uh, even back in the base camp, uh, you were not safe. Rockets and mortars coming in once in a while. And they even tried to invade our base camp uh, a few times. But, uh, so I, I'm very, very thankful that I was never injured or worse. Uh, the normal uh, tour for a Marine over there was 13 months. And when my 13 months was just about up, I had two days left to go. I had to go report to this officer. He was in this little shack and I walked in there and, and uh, he was sitting behind the desk. He was doing some paperwork. And uh, uh, I walks up to the front of his desk and he starts thanking me. He's thanking me for all what I've done. And, uh, and he says, yeah, we really appreciate all the work that you put in, but I have to offer you one thing. If you extend for another six months, you will be promoted to the next highest rank. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, God, I've been here 13 long months. Don't swear. Uh, I've been here 13 long months, busted my ass, and he wants me to stay another six months. And I thought, I thought to myself, this officer must be out of his frickin' mind. <laughs> and so after thinking about this for about three or four seconds, uh, then I responded, uh, no sir, no thanks. So then he says to me, okay, Tomorrow you'll be flying back to Da Nang, and then from Da Nang you fly out of the country. So him and I, we both shook hands. The next day he come, I, I said goodbye to all the guys that I was with, and I flew back to Da Nang, and then in Da Nang I had to get some shots and get my paperwork confirmed. And then the morning of the next day, I went down to the airstrip, and there was roughly, I don't know, about 75 other guys. Their time was up, they were leaving the country too. So we all get on this plane, and I got right by the window. I got a window seat. And we all get buckled in, and we take off down the runway. And uh, I, can, I can still remember those tires of that plane separating from the pavement of Vietnam. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm actually really getting out of here. So we're climbing up and climbing up, and I'm looking out the window, and it's a clear, bright, sunny day, and you can see the Vietnam for miles. We're getting up higher and higher, and all of a sudden the pilot comes off the comes over the loudspeaker, and he says, "I got something to say to you guys. You are now out of rocket range." Holy Christ! All, all of us guys, we were we're all screaming and yelling. We made it. We made it. We're going home. We made it. Uh, 
everybody, you know, shaking each other's hands, yelling and screaming. The, the noise inside that plane was unreal. And, and after the noise settled down somewhat, then I looked out the window and I could still see the land of Vietnam. And all of a sudden this feeling of sadness went right through my whole body. I was, I was thinking of the guys down there. Uh, here on one hand, I was happy as hell. I'm, I'm go, you know, I made it, I'm going home. And on the other hand, I was almost crying. I was almost crying, thinking of all the guys that were still down there fighting the war. It, it, and I'll, I'll never forget that feeling. I mean, uh, happiness and sadness all at the same time. So then we flew over to Okinawa, stayed there about 10 days, and then we flew back to the United States. But uh, that 13 months, that was quite an experience. Uh, everything that I saw and what I went through, and it's just something that, that you never forget. Well, what's really fun about your experience is that for um, not that it's easier, but I think for American soldiers, right? If you make it, then you come back. But after your tour is done, but for the Hmong, you know, soldiers, there's no exit strategy. You know, you serve eight years, you know, there's no, you know, 12 month or 16 month tour. You just continue to serve until the end. But that's a very different, you know, experience. So I know, um, so Mr. Tao, you, you began to talk about your work already. So, you know, tell, you maybe spend a few more minutes. You were a radio, radio operator for eight years. You saw a lot as well. So maybe spend a few minutes talking a little bit more about what you, other things that you did. And then we want to give the word to Mr. Moore. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> ตัวทหารเนี่ยเหรอว่าเนี่ยเนาะยานไหนสายเนาะยาเต่าอีกยุ่งเชียวตัวยานของเราเนี่ยเป็นรีออปเปอร์ที่ปีเอ็ดปี
ไอ้เตะเกอวัวเฮาหลุยเตะตัวก็วัวซึ่งชี้ตัวเตะตัวชี้ตัวซึ่งหลอกเจ้าตัวเผาเตะตัวได้เถอะเนาะยอดสงคร
Tức là chơi là ít khác xích của nó chơi cổ thôi chứ không Maybe a baker, maybe they're hiding somewhere Thì bà nó Lì nó chơi Sẽ tổ trò chơi của tôi tôi thấy chơi nó chơi Ô nụ chơi chơi của kia hoa lửa Nó kia là cả nó bó chơi Yeah, after the war, I came to this country in 1976 I went to work two days after I arrived so people know I did not go on welfare. <laughs> <laughs> For my first job, I was paid $2.30. Yeah, I think gas was about 49 or 50 cents a gallon. Look, gas stations are not cheap, which is the road of the road. So because of financial, I think one gas station was 50 cents a gallon. I will go to the one that's 49 cents. Okay, when I go for a hundred, I was in 1982, oh, 81, 80, 81, I was able to go to school and to learn online class. So by 1981, I, I was able to go to school and to learn a machine tool yes. in Eau Claire. Okay. 27 days, new graduation, this is the Dalhaan channel, machine operator. Okay, so I've been a machine operator for uh, 27 days after I graduated. Okay. Good. So I worked in that field all the way until I just retired. I retired. What time? Who retired this? This is the whole question. Oh, about 10 minutes now. 2009. 2009. Okay. Great. So, and we have to end at 6.30. So, I have another question. Several of you talked about how, you know, you mentioned earlier you never knew about Hmong Thailand. When you were in Vietnam, I take it you were never interacting with local people either, you were mostly with American soldiers, right? Um, we, we work with the mountain yards. With the mountain yards, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people confuse that and they say, oh, we work with Hmong, no, Hmong Yards are the highland people in central Vietnam. So a lot of American soldiers um, actually work with them, but Hmong and Hmong Tanya are two, two different groups of people. But I do want to ask the gentleman over there, um, your experience. I know that all three of you recently went on a uh, honor flight to Vietnam. And then I'll ask you what that was like for you to go back. And then for Mr. Tao, Mr. Moore, you know, think about, you know, have you been back to Laos and what was that like for you if you have come back? But we'll start with, what was that honor flight like for you? It was amazing. I was reluctant to go, I was, like most of us, because of all the bad memories we had from Vietnam. But uh, when we got there, the people were so welcoming. They, they were so happy to see us. Uh, they, they couldn't wait to hug us, to be nice to us. Uh, totally different than what we expected. Um, and, and our guides told us they don't, they don't even care about the war anymore. They don't talk about it, they don't, it's in the past. We kind of remember those things here in the United States and bring it up over and over. They don't, it's not even in their memory anymore. They look to the future now. So they were very pleasant to us over there. Uh, we had a great time. Um, saw everything from the Mekong Delta all the way up to Hanoi. And uh, everybody, wherever we went, uh, were very nice to us. Um, I had an experience at Hanoi, we were looking at the John McCain Memorial, and as I was walking around it, a gentleman was sitting on a bench on the back side of it, uh, and he got up and he came over to me and asked me if I was a soldier, and I said I had been, and he said he was a, a North Vietnamese soldier, and he reached his hand out and shook my hand, and then he asked me if I would forgive him. And I was kind of stunned because the guides had told us that for every American that died in Vietnam, 17 Vietnamese soldiers were killed. So almost a million Vietnamese soldiers were killed, and we only had 58,000. And yet he was asking me to forgive him. It was amazing. Yeah. 
um, he gave me a hug and, and uh, we talked. We had pictures taken with him and everything. Uh, it was it was quite an experience. I was thrilled that I went. I mean, the trip was like that. I guess for me the uh, the trip was just unbelievable. I I was very reluctant uh, along with my brother for many many years to even go on to go back and to think about going back there because I didn't want nothing to do with that place once I got out of there. And I had to live with that for about 50 years, you know, my feelings and that. And that was that was hard. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, it just. Uh, it's these, these people are just so wonderful over there that you can't imagine. I mean, like Glenn was saying, they, they'll come and hug you, and, and uh, you just, it's unbelievable. But for me, I guess, for me, my goal going over there was to get forgiveness from the people toward the way I felt. And uh, so I wanted to go back to where my brother and I, we were actually in the same place but not at the same time. And but actually, for me, my goal was just to get forgiveness, I felt, from the people because I had to live with myself for years and years. I had a lot of nightmares, and I didn't do nothing to the people physically, but I just, I hated the way I felt toward these people because I hated every one of them. I didn't care how, the babies, the, the little kids, the, the I hated all of them. And I had to live with that, you know, for many, many years. So my goal was to go back and um, just to, to go back to where we were, where we were stationed, and then to meet one of, uh, well, I got to meet one of the, the same gentlemen that uh, Glenn was talking about, NBA, and I got also to meet a lady from the Viet Cong. And uh, you talk about, it's different. These are people that are trying to kill you, and you're trying to kill them over there. And, and, but then when we met, you know, we hugged, we shook hands, and you know, and for me, I was going over there for a purpose. I wanted forgiveness, but I also had my mind made up that when I would, would I, when I would meet some of these people, my main thing was I wanted to let them know that I was sorry for what we did. That was, so, I got all that out and uh, we come back in uh, Menasha High School and, and it was wonderful, you know, and a lot of tears of joy. But uh, it was just uh, fantastic. So that was my goal. And uh, to be very honest with you, I felt that I didn't say nothing to anybody, but I felt I was going over there and I wasn't coming back. And I didn't, I didn't say nothing to my, my wife, my kids, nobody. I, I felt I was going over there I was gonna do what I had to do, and I wasn't coming back, and that was, but after about a week I got that done, it's like, okay, I felt so good about myself that it's like, you know, I wanna come back, you know, and now I wanna come back. But before that, I felt like I didn't really deserve to come back. But, uh, yeah, it was a lot of tears, uh, and, and uh, since I've been back, I've never had one nightmare, not one, and it's just, so uh, it was quite an experience. I'd love to go back again. If, if the opportunity ever come about, I would love to go back. Uh, I can't say enough about these people, but you know, war is war, you know, and you're, you're different. You're, you're a different person, you know. When I came back, I was somebody different, but then when I went back the second time, that's who I really was. And these people, it's like they saw that, you know, they just, they, they were happy. They, They'd say hi to you, they'd hug you, and they, you know, whatever. I mean, it was just, these people are just unbelievable. I, you know, it's like, I, I probably trust these people over the American people. I mean, these people are just unbelievable. I just, if you, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, if you go on the website, Old Glory Honor Flight, they got a lot of pictures, a lot of videos on there. And um, it was uh, really nice. We had like 52 veterans. and. One dropped out, so there were there would have been 53. But it was, excuse me, I, I can't say enough what it did for me, and yeah, so I was very happy. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I mean, it was seems really healing for you, and I'm sure for the others as well. Uh, 
Yes, after 50 years to go back there with all these other guys, plus my brother, uh, it was such a great trip. I really enjoyed it. Uh, everything that we did and everything we saw, it was just unreal, you know, and the Vietnamese people, you know, uh, smiling at you, shaking your hands, uh, waving at you. Uh, it was such a good feeling. Um, uh, gosh, it was just uh, so great. Uh, there's, there's three things, three things that really impressed me about the Vietnamese people. Uh, number one, they were all like skinny. They're all normal, you know. It was very rare to see any of them that were way overweight. That was number one. The, num the second thing that really impressed me was their uh, transportation. I mean, you had thousands of motorbikes all over the place. Uh, and when we got down to Sandy, uh, when we got down to Saigon, uh, we were standing out on the sidewalk and we were watching all this and I'm just shaking my head, you know, and we were right by this intersection and there's no stop signs, no traffic lights. And I thought, how do they do this? And uh, the more I thought about this is, uh, well, they were all going about the same rate of speed and they all had courtesy and respect towards each other. So if you got courtesy and respect towards each other, well, I guess you don't need no stop signs or traffic lights. And uh, the third thing that really impressed me about those people is that they completely put the war in the past. I mean, it's done, you know, they put it in the past, they moved forward, they tried to improve everything. I mean, their cities, everything. When I was there, it was just dirt roads and little shacks and straw huts, or whatever and bicycles, uh, but now it's just amazing how far they have gone, you know, uh, how, how far they have improved their lives, uh, they enjoy, you can see it uh, on their faces, they enjoy their lives, they get along with everybody, they're happy, and you know, when you really think about it, uh, yeah, it would really be nice for all the countries in the Middle East to do the same thing as what the people of Vietnam have done. Thank you. So we we now have eight minutes left, and so I want to give um, you each a few minutes to talk about if you have been back, or maybe some reflections about your own personal healing. Um, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more uh, to. Uh, Say uh, but but I like to thank you for uh, the president who is uh, president on 1973. Is it Nixon? Yeah, he the one is uh, signed the contract to start the war. So save our life. If the life still going then everybody is gone. So thank you very much for the president to stop the war and bring us to the United States. So now we are safe. Thank you very much. So I want to um, just kind of acknowledge the support that John F. Kennedy, um, you know, gave us uh, until he passed away in 19, well, he was assassinated in 1963. Yeah, the Yep, he was instrumental in helping us at the beginning. Okay. <coughs> I went to the villages, but I didn't recognize anything. I didn't 
I didn't recognize it because the trees that used to be there are not there. Uh, all the bombing that took place um, uh, destroyed that, so I didn't recognize it anymore. So I'm just um, grateful and I trust the United States and this is the number one place for me. Thank you. So we just have a couple minutes left, but I just want to say thank you so much for your contributions. I learned a lot and I just want to say your point about the Vietnamese people and Lao or Cambodian, whoever was involved in the war. I have actually been back to um, that region 10 times myself. And I know that every time I go visit my cousins in the villages, you know, uh, or the Vietnamese you know, people that I meet all over Vietnam, you are right. But I think it's not because people don't want to think about it. You know, it's that they have to move on. They don't have a choice, right? They don't have a choice. You, you have to continue living. So you can't just, you know, think about the past and then not live. So that's what I love about their, their um, the ways in which they practice their daily life is that, you know, uh, what's done is done and we are going to still welcome you. Um, and I think that we all can, you're right, learn a lot about how we can heal uh, from all of these tragedies. And uh, we can't change yesterday or 50 years ago, but can we change tonight and tomorrow and the days to come so that our communities can get in peace. So I'll turn it over to Trisha. So at the